Hello there, dear friends, and welcome once again to the Relaxed Fantasy Review. Today, we're going to be doing another character build, and we're going to be going over one of the, arguably, most popular subclasses, or classes, rather, in all of D&D, the Bard. Bards are considered the jacks of all trades. They are the ones who bring the skills, the magic, the weapons, the music. They truly can do a little bit of everything. But how do you play a bard straight from the beginning of the game? What I've done here is I have a character sheet in front of me of a level 5 bard that I have designed, and I'm going to discuss their level-by-level -level progression. So for those who've never played a bard before, this is a very simple baseline build that will not overly complicate how a bard is played. Bards are not simple, even by this standard that I've got in front of me. This is still a build you're going to have to study and learn to understand, but I've made it as easy as I can. So, starting right away at the beginning. When you choose a character, I like to choose my race first, because the race is the part of you that's picked before anything else is picked uh, in a real-life concept. And I've decided that for this bard, I'm going with the halfling. Halflings are D&D's uh, royalty-free hobbits, and halflings have quite a few features that lend themselves to the happy-go-lucky nature of the bard. The feature that is most famous that halflings have is their lucky feature. This is not to be confused with a lucky feat, which is something any character can take, which is considered to be one of the greatest feats in the game. No, the lucky feature that halflings have simply states that if you roll a 1 on a d20 roll, so an attack roll, ability check, saving throw, whatever, uh, you can re-roll it. So, basically, halflings can't crit fail. And that's actually a very nice trait. A lot of DMs will argue that crit fails are automatic fails, regardless of modifiers. Uh, rules as written, that only applies to attacks, but a lot of people play it that way with skill checks, too. And so, um, yeah... The, the lucky feature just kind of helps alleviate a lot of that. It really makes it so that you can, you know, stay out of the, the worst dice rolls. Uh, they also get the brave feature, which states that they uh, have advantage against being frightened. So that's nice. And they have halfling nimbleness, which states that they can move through the space of medium or larger creatures which normally takes skill checks, you have to shove or, you know, worm your way around folks. Halflings can just do this. So, that's nice. They can't stop in the same place, like, they can't literally be underneath a person at the end of their turn, but moving through crowds or moving through enemy lines, a pretty nice feature. And then there's a couple different options for types of halflings, sub-races. I chose the stout halfling, which gives you stout resilience. And this means that you have advantage against being poisoned and resistant to poison, which is similar to the Dwarven traits. Uh, overall, I think this is a very solid race to choose. Um, you also get to choose a background. And in this case, I've gone with the urchin background. I like the idea of a halfling being, you know, an orphan on the city streets and hanging out in the taverns and really getting to know the, like, lower-class citizens of a city, and learning that, uh, where do they go when they need to blow off steam and really have their community? Well, they go to the taverns and they listen to the entertainers. And so the urchin grew up around this. Uh, this gives you, you know, a couple t extra tool proficiencies, as well as a couple skill proficiencies, which we'll go over in a moment. But you also get the City Secrets feature, which means that if you're in an urban environment, you're very good at navigating it quickly. 
you know how to go through alleys, you know how to go through sewer systems, you know how to scale rooftops. You, you're just really, really good at moving around in a city. So you can evade capture or navigate or track more efficiently. It's, it's a nice uh, feature that will come up if you're in a city-based campaign. But now let's get on to the bard themselves. What is a bard? At their core, a bard is a support and utility class. That is their primary function. Their primary function is not to be the tank or to do the damage. It is to use their magic and their bardic inspiration to power up the rest of the party. A bard on their own will struggle much more than most other classes because they are built to help others. And you see this right away at level one. When you choose the class Bard, you get the feature Bardic Inspiration. This is a number of D6 hit dice, uh, sorry, D6 dice, equal to your Charisma modifier. We'll go over stats here in a sec. And Bardic Inspiration allows you, as a bonus action, to inspire another creature. This cannot be yourself. That's why you don't work well as a solo Bard. When you use Bardic Inspiration, the creature essentially gets the d6, and in the next 10 minutes, they can choose to add that d6 to any attack roll or ability check or saving throw that they make. This is powerful. This is the sort of thing that people want to hand out a lot. A d6 is an average of three and a half points, so three or four extra points on a roll can turn misses into hits, or can turn failures into successes. It's good stuff. Uh, as far as equipment, uh, bards are proficient in light armor, and simple weapons along with a couple choice uh, martial weapons. For this bard, I'm picking up a rapier. Rapier is a classic bard weapon, and one of the best uh, one-handed weapons in the game. Uh, they also get leather armor as a part of their standard gear, and a dagger, just in case they need something extra. Uh, I've given this bard an entertainer's pack, as well as a loot, which works as their spellcasting focus. As far as stats go, I went with point by and Tasha's uh, rules where you can adjust the uh, plus two plus one from your race to whatever you like. I went with a 10 in strength because it's not really a key feature of the bard. And then I went with a 15 in dexterity and put my plus one there for a 16. Then I took a 12 constitution and a 10 in intelligence and an 11 in wisdom. That was one of my uh, leftover stats. And then I took a 14 in Charisma and put my plus two there. So I have positive modifiers in Dexterity, Charisma, and then a plus one in my Constitution as well. Uh, I get proficiency in Dexterity and Charisma saving throws as a bard. And then I get three extra skills on top of the two that I got um, from my background. Overall, I have proficiency in acrobatics, which I have a plus five in due to my proficiency in my decks. And then I have a perception proficiency, which I have a plus three, uh, two in thanks to my proficiency bonus. I have a persuasion proficiency, so that's a plus five. Then I have um, sleight of hand, which is a five due to dexterity. And then stealth which is a five due to dexterity as well. So we're doing okay skill-wise. We've got five proficiencies in some solid skills, perception, persuasion, and stealth, all good stuff. Uh, with my plus three in dex and my uh, leather armor, I've got an AC of 14 currently. Halflings only get their speed of 25, so they're a little slower than most other classes. And um, hit point-wise, bards have a d8 hit point, and with my constitution of 12, that means that at level 1 I have 9 hit points. I am not a tank. However, bards do have spellcasting. Now, bards are learned spellcasters, meaning that when they level up, they learn spells naturally, and then they maintain those spells for their entire career. Now, when we're talking about the bard, bards are charisma-based casters. So with my plus three in Charisma and my Proficiency bonus, my Spell Attack bonus is a plus five, and my Spell Save DC is a 13. 
I get to choose some cantrips uh, as I as I start off here. I've chosen to take Vicious Mockery, which is the only attacking cantrips bards have. It does a D4 of psychic damage against a wisdom save, so it's okay. It's not bad because it does mean that the enemies will have disadvantage on their attacks, but for my calculations, I won't be looking at Vicious Mockery. I'll be focusing on the rapier. I also took Minor Illusion as my uh, second cantrip here. And then I get four uh, first level spells and two slots to cast them with every long rest. For these, I chose Disguise Self, which is a phenomenal infiltration and uh, social tactic. It, it allows you to, for an hour without concentration, appear like someone that you've seen before. And uh, yeah, this would be really, really nice. Healing Word. Uh, to support the party, Healing Word is a bonus action to cast and restores a few hit points. Uh, 1d4 plus my spellcasting modifier, so that's an average of 5 or 6. And it lets me pop an, uh, an ally back up with a bonus action. At a range. Then there's Dissonant Whispers. This is uh, an attacking spell that you use and the creature makes a save and they take psychic damage. And if they fail their save, they have to run from you. So it's a nice little, you know, battlefield control spell. And finally, and most importantly, my favorite first level spell for this build is Fairy Fire. Fairy Fire is an area of effect spell that when you cast it, creatures within it make a dexterity save, and if they fail it, they are now outlined in magical light. All attacks against them will now have advantage. So this means you're more likely to hit them. It does require concentration, but it's one of the best ways that you can support both your own attacks and your allies. Because anything, melee, spell, ranged, whatever, Fairy Fire gives advantage to all of them. All that use attack rolls, anyway. So here we are at level 1. We've got a plus 5 to hit with our Rapier, a spell save DC of 13, and an armor class of 14, and 9 hit points. So I've gone over the combat effectiveness of the Bard at level 1. Round one, we use Fairy Fire to light up our enemies, and we're going to assume that, you know, some of them have been lit up, and those will be the ones we attack. And then we go in and start attacking with our Rapier. Uh, because of our plus to hit, um, and the advantage that we're granted from Fairy Fire, um, I've done the math for a CR one quarter enemy, as well as a CR one enemy. A CR one quarter enemy, uh, you're... Average to hit them is 90%, so you're going to hit them most of the time if they're lit up by fairy fire. And your average damage with your rapier is going to be about 8 damage. So you're going to take about 6 rounds to kill a CR 1 quarter enemy. On the flip side, a CR 1 enemy actually will have roughly the same armor class, so you should still have a 90% chance of killing them, or hitting them rather. You're doing 8 damage, but they have more hit points, so it'll actually take... 10 rounds of you fighting it to beat it. Now remember, these numbers are in a vacuum. This is assuming that you are the only one fighting. So, what about defending? A CR one quarter creature will only hit you 45% of the time uh, with your armor class of 14, but they're going to do 5 damage to you when they do so, and you only have 9 hit points. So you're only going to last 2 rounds against this creature. This is why the Bard is not the frontline fighter. Because even a CR one quarter creature has a pretty good shot of killing you before you can kill it, if you're just facing it in direct combat. On the flip side, um, a CR one creature also has a 45% chance to hit you, but it's going to do 12 damage to you. Um, meaning it will one-shot you. A CR one creature could absolutely one-shot a level one bard. So, only go into battle... Um, if you've got someone else backing you up, a fighter, a barbarian, a paladin, something like that. And um, my honest recommendation is to use your action to use fairy fire to power up your party's attacks. And then, yes, if you can get a sword attack off, fantastic. But honestly, Vicious Mockery would probably be safer to use at this sort of level. Because you want to be available to use your other spell slot for an emergency healing word if necessary. Anyway, moving on to level 2. The Bard levels up to level 2. They get an additional 6 hit points, which brings them up to, what is that, 15 now? 
but it's it's the average of their d8 hit die, which is a five, plus one from their constitution modifier. Um, but they do get some fun little features here. They do get another spell, so they get to learn command. That's the spell I've chosen. Command's a nice spell because it allows you to, against a saving throw, use issue a one-word command to a creature. Grovel's a great one because it makes them drop prone, or drop because it can disarm them, or flee because it can make them run away. Not a bad uh, little feature, um, and it does make them use their action on their turn to perform this command. So it robs them of a turn, which is nice. Uh, and you get another spell slot, so now you have three. So you can use Fairy Fire and still have two castings per long rest. Um, you also get the Jack of All fa Trades feature, and this is a good one. At this point, your proficiency bonus is still two. But Jack of All Trades states that you can apply half of your proficiency bonus to any skill check that you aren't already proficient in. So all of those wisdom and intelligence-based skills, and even the strength-based skill, athletics, all of those skills that you're not proficient in, medicine, nature, insight, history, athletics, animal handling, survival, all of those get a plus one. And this is the secret strength of the bard, is that they don't really suck at anything, even the things they're not proficient in. They are wonderful at their skills, and having this jack-of-all-trades will give you that little boost that you need. You also get the Song of Rest feature, and this states that during a short rest, while you're using your hit dice to recover hit points, you can play a song for you and your allies, and you get extra hit points back. So that's a nice little feature as well. Then we get to level three. And level three is where things really change for the bard, because they get their subclass. And for this bard, I've chosen the Valor School. The School of Valor, or the College of Valor, rather, um, means that the bard is more suited to war and fighting. This is a great way to balance your bard out by giving them extra proficiencies in armor and weapons. It gives them proficiency in all weapons, so if you wanted to grab a big two-handed weapon, you could. I didn't build my bard for strength, so I'm not going to do that, but you could. And you get proficiency in medium armor and shields, which is key. I've decided that I'm going to upgrade my bardic armor at this point. I'm going to swap in my leather armor and go find myself some breastplate, medium armor, and a shield. This means that my armor class goes from 14 to 18, making me much harder to hit. Because it turns out that having better armor makes you harder to hit. You also get expertise at level 3. Which means that you will have uh, two of your proficient skills. I've chosen Persuasion and Stealth with this bard. Where you get to double the proficiency bonus that you add. So the, you've got a Charisma and a Dex-based skill here. They get the plus three from their stat. Now they get a plus two to their proficiency bonus. This means that they now go from having a five in those skills to having a, a plus seven. And breastplate armor does not give you disadvantage on your stealth checks. That's why I chose it. It's actually the best armor you can wear that doesn't give you disadvantage on stealth. So, with an AC of 18, expertise in stealth, as well as persuasion, so that's another cool thing, uh, you're sitting much more solid in combat. You also get combat inspiration. This is a new thing that powers up your bardic inspiration. That d6 die that you used to give people that can buff their attacks or their ability checks, now they can use it when they attack to buff their damage. So you can add an extra d6 to damage. But more um, impactfully, it can affect their armor class. When they're hit by an attack, if they have an inspiration die, they can use their reaction to, re to roll it and add that to their AC. An extra 3 or 4 to AC is monumental. It's huge. And even though it's just against that one attack, that can be the difference between life and death for a fighter if they're on the edge. 
You also get second level spells here, and for the purposes of this, I've chosen the spell Invisibility my favorite second level spell, and one of the greatest spells, especially down here at level three, you cast it on yourself or someone else, and they are invisible for an hour with your concentration. This means that you're gonna have all of the benefits of invisibility, you know, you can't be seen. This makes you very, very hard to pinpoint. Uh, lots of spells and other attacks require sight. You have to be able to see your target, so it avoids all those. The only downside is that it isn't a combat trick. You can't use invisibility to hit someone because if you attack or cast a spell, the invisibility goes away. So this is a stealth thing only, but what a stealth thing. So here we are at level three. Our combat tactics haven't really changed. We're still using fairy fire as our combat magic and our concentration and then attacking with our rapier when appropriate. I've done the math for a CR1 and a CR3 enemy. Against a CR1 enemy, we're going to be still hitting 90% of the time, and we're going to do an average damage of 8 still, that hasn't changed, which means it's still going to take us 10 rounds to kill the creature. Uh, and against a CR3 enemy, you're also hitting 90% of the time, doing an average of 8 damage, and it takes you 14 rounds to kill. So even a Valor Bard isn't doing more damage, really. So why did we take the subclass? Well, let's have a look at the defensive side. The CR1 creature was one-shotting us before, with a 45% chance to hit with their attacks. Now, with our armor class being 18, their chance to hit is only 25%. Now, when they do hit, they are going to do an average of 12 damage still. So a CR1 creature can still kill us in two rounds if it hits us, but it's harder to hit us. Even a CR3 creature only has a chance to hit of 30%. So the point of the armor wasn't to save us as far as how often we can get hit, it's to stop us from getting hit. The average damage of CR3 creatures 24, which is our health. So, yeah, we're going to go down in a single round, pretty much. But it's still okay. I think, I think our health is actually uh, 21 at this point. So, yeah, it can still one a boss monster can still one-shot us, but they have to hit us first. So we're doing better as far as hit chance goes. Now, at level 4, all characters can either choose an ability score increase or a feat. Now... There's a specific feat that's in Xanathar's Guide to Everything called Bountiful Luck. It must be taken by a halfling. And this feature effectively extends the reach of your lucky feature, where if another creature crit fails near you, you can use your reaction to let them reroll it. So, those, uh, those ones... Now they're not just not affecting you, they're also not affecting the rest of the party. No more crit fails from anyone in the party, as long as you have your reaction free. You don't have a much use for your reaction, you know, you don't have reaction spells, and you're probably not making opportunity attacks that often, so I would use this any time a friend roll a one. It's, it's just nice to give them basically another shot at it. And as a bard who's supposed to be supporting other people, this is really, really good. Then finally at level 5, which is where we're going to stop the build, uh, you get the Font of Inspiration feature. This means that you can recover your Bardic Inspiration on a short rest, not a long rest. So those three, point, those three dice you have that you've been handing out to your allies, well now you can recharge them on a short rest. So that's handy. Basically every fight you're going to have some. Also the Inspiration die go up to a d8 instead of a d6. So now you're averaging 4.5 instead of 3.5. That's a nice boost to the armor class and attack rolls of all your friends. And you get to hand it out more often. Your proficiency bonus goes up here, so you get it to plus three. That means that all of those skills that you're proficient in get a bump. All of the skills that you ex have an expertise in, so persuasion and stealth, they now have plus nines to their modifiers, so that's really nice. And your attack bonuses go up, and your spell save DC goes up, everything's great. 
Um, back at level four, I forgot to mention, I, another second level spell that I was going to take was Suggestion, which is a spell that allows you to give someone an idea, and if they fail a saving throw, they will do that idea to the best of their ability. It's, it's pseudo-mind control. Very powerful spell. But at level five, we get our third level spell slots, and we get to choose a third level spell. And for me, I have chosen Hypnotic Pattern. Hypnotic Pattern is a control spell for a whole battlefield. In an area, a bunch of lights appear, and creatures have to make a saving throw. If they fail the save, they are hypnotized. What really happens is that they are charmed by you, and they are also incapacitated, and their speed drops to zero. So they just kind of go into this stupor. Now, it doesn't hurt them, but it does stop them from doing anything. Um... To get them out of that stupor, they either have to be shaken out of it or take damage. But assuming that most creatures on the field will fail their saving throw, your saving throw is a 14 right now, so a good portion of them will, that means that you have bought yourself either half of the enemies are just out of the fight, or the other half that succeeded on their saves have to shake their friends awake using their action. Meaning you have now cost an entire the entire other side of the fight, their action. And if they do decide to fight, now they are going to be outnumbered, you know, way worse than they were before. So Hypnotic Pattern is going to be my concentration spell now. It means we're going to lose advantage on our attacks. We're not going to have Hypno um, Fairy Fire going anymore. But honestly, I would rather cut the number of enemies on the field in half like that rather than give me and everyone else advantage on my attacks. That seems like a better option support-wise to me. So the standard way I'll be handling combat from now on is cast Hypnotic Pattern and then make attacks against the creatures that aren't hypnotized. And then at the end of the fight, you can do with whoever's left, you can do what you want with them, really. Tie them up. You could attack them and break the hypnotism, but it gives you the ability to make that decision. I've done the math here for a CR2 creature and CR5 creature. As far as attacking goes, uh, you've got a, because you've lost your advantage, now you only have a 65% chance to hit a CR2 creature. Doing an average of 8 damage, it'll take you 12 rounds to kill that creature. And against a CR5 creature, you only have a 55% chance to hit. With an average damage of 8, that would take you 18 rounds to kill it. So, the bard still is not your frontline fighter. You are not going to be the meaningful damage dealer up there at the front of the fight. Especially since on the defensive side, even with your 18 armor class, a CR2 creature has a 25% chance to hit you, does 18 damage on a hit, you have 33 hit points, so that'll kill you in two rounds if it manages to hit you. However, a CR5 creature has a 40% chance to hit you, even with that armor class and does 36 damage on average, meaning that you cannot go up against the boss. It's gonna one-shot you. This is the point of the Bard. The Bard, a lot of people think the Bard can do anything. And to be fair, there are some Bardic subclasses that can add to their damage in meaningful ways. But that's not what the Valor Bard is about. The Valor Bard is about being defensive, adding more armor to yourself. And you can still use your Rapier, just like you could before. But it gives your bardic inspiration the power to defend your allies by boosting their AC. And to defend yourself by boosting your own armor class through medium armor. This is the kind of bard that doesn't do the killing. This is the kind of bard that inspires others to do the killing. It leans hard into bardic inspiration. Add into that your lucky feature, that your bountiful luck is going to uh, give to your allies. Your font of inspiration means you can hand out this extra inspiration, these d8s on short rests. And you using either fairy fire for advantage, invisibility for infiltration, or hypnotic pattern to take out half of the enemies in one go. Like, doing damage isn't the name of the game here. Your amazing skills, your amazing magic, and your inspiration. That's what bards are all about. So, 
If you do decide to play a bard, don't get sucked into thinking that you can stand next to the fighter and the barbarian killing enemies. That's not what you're here for. You are here to make sure that the fighter and the barbarian can kill the enemies, incapacitate the enemies they're not fighting, and keep yourself safe while inspiring those around you. Bards are incredible at basically everything other than damage dealing. And I think that it's important to remember that when you play a bard. Don't get disappointed because you're not hitting for, you know, double-digit damage all the time. That's not the point. The point is to make sure everyone else is doing their best while you're taking care of everything outside of combat. This has been the Relaxed Fantasy Review. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe down below, and keep your eyes peeled for more character builds coming down the line soon. Have a good one, my friends.